forward with the event. Um, so yes, everyone, welcome to our event, Invisible Barriers, Surviving HIV and COVID-19. Um, as written in the description, we'll be talking today about different forms of discrimination, such as stigma, racism, homophobia, transphobia, and how um, that those invisible barriers um, uh, really affect or impact communities of color um, and how that affects them on a daily basis. Uh, uh, we are doing a Q&A, so uh, if folks want to submit questions, we'll do our best to answer those uh, towards the end of this session. I'll go ahead and show the uh, next slide for our panelists. Uh, so for our panelists today, I will go ahead and introduce them by name and give them a chance to share just a little bit about um, uh, themselves and what they're looking forward to discussing at this event. Uh, I would first like to introduce Dr. Jonathan Garcia, who is joining us from the College of Public Health and Human Sciences at Oregon State University. Hi, Jose. Thank you for inviting me to this awesome panel. I'm really looking forward to really digging into uh, the vulnerabilities that affect people of color um, across HIV and COVID-19 and any emerging pandemics. Uh, my name is Jonathan Garcia. I'm an assistant professor in global health at Oregon State University. I'm also the program director of the global health program. And global health is all about thinking about processes that uh, polarize us, that leave us vulnerable um, and so we're thinking not just about, you know, one pandemic, but we're thinking about the underlying issues. So that's what I'm really excited to talk about. It's good to be here. All right. Thank you, Dr. Jonathan Garcia. Uh, next, I would like to introduce Dr. Allison Matthews, Executive Director and Research Fellow in Faith and Health. Hello, and thank you for um, inviting, to be on, inviting me to be on this panel. I am excited about talking about um, my new role as the executive director of the Faith, Faith Coordinating Center and thinking about how we can address um, stigma around HIV in faith communities. Uh, my background is as a sociologist, so I think about identity, I think about stigma and overlapping experiences with discrimination, especially around uh, race, ethnicity, and sexuality. And so I'm excited to think about how those things overlap in faith communities and how we can leverage the history of social justice and faith communities to address HIV stigma. So thank you for having me. Thank you. And lastly, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Roberto Orellana. Associate Dean for Research and Sponsored Projects at Portland State University School of Social Work. Hi, everyone. And um, yeah, same here. I want to thank uh, the organization for inviting me. And I'm really looking forward to, uh, to learning from uh, Drs. Matthews and Garcia and have a discussion with, with you all and, and the audience about uh, HIV and COVID and communities of color. So really looking forward to this and just very briefly, I saw in the chat, just so you know, Jose, that they're also asking to give the interpretation uh, information in Spanish for the Spanish speakers so they know what to do. Oh, I see, I see. Um, entonces, ¿cómo explicarlo en español? Oh, sí, uh, en, en su menú en Zoom, uh, a la derecha va a estar como un símbolo que se mira como el mundo. Y allí puedes uh, presionar ese botón para hacer, uh, seleccionar el lenguaje en español. Um, uh, ojalá eso te, eso te ayuda. Ok. Bueno, vamos a empezar. Or, sorry, I just switched over to Spanish. <laughs> um, all right, we're going to start here. Just like uh, stop sharing my screen so I can see all of your lovely faces. Um, and all right, so what we will first discuss is 
just, you know, defining a pandemic really. Um, and uh, officially, I guess a pandemic is defined as a disease that spreads over a whole country or the whole world. Um, and doing some research, I found that, uh, you know, the first recorded pandemic um, was nearly 2,450 years ago, I believe, um, in 430 BC. And I think usually when people think of a pandemic, you know, they, they kind of go to the Black Death in 1350 or the Spanish flu in 1918. Um, you know, those are some that just might come to mind. So um, even though pandemic infectious diseases uh, have been part of human history for a long time, uh, the word pandemic has kind of been thrown around a lot as a buzzword during COVID-19. Um, and, you know, I just want to hear from you all about kind of what is, um, you know, in, in basic terms, what is a pandemic? Um, and I'll actually go ahead and hand this off to, I believe, uh, Dr. Matthews. A pandemic um, is when a virus or a disease spreads across the entire world. So, you know, usually we think about, uh, or, you know, I guess the difference between an epidemic and a pandemic is that the pandemic is rapidly spreading um, across the entire world and affects pretty much everyone. Whereas an epidemic, it may have affected the entire world, but we, we may have some kind of um, measures set in place to address the, the epidemic at that point. And our, um, so I think that's the main distinction. It's not a major distinction between them. Yeah, I would just add, uh, yeah, uh, for just for you to, to think about, um, mainly that in any village or town, uh, we have some expected number of diseases that are going to come up every year, the flu or this or that. And this when there's more than what's expected, right? That's when it becomes an outbreak. So there's more food poisonings, right? Uh, from some restaurant or something. So that's an outbreak, which is very localized. And then it can become epidemic as, it, as more and more people get that disease rapidly. And as Dr. Matthew said, that once it moves to other towns or possibly other countries or the whole continent, then it becomes that pandemic. And, uh, so. Yeah, and I would like to add, you know, we're already talking about pandemics, but the term syndemic really fits with this because we're thinking about intersecting and overlaid pandemics, right? So it's even more complicated than just a pandemic across the world. It's really thinking about how does the pandemic of mental health, you know, disparities and drug use and, you know, HIV and COVID-19, how do those things work synergistically, right? And so as we talk more about the kinds of people who are vulnerable to COVID-19 and HIV, we're really talking about the syndemic, um, which is the combination, that synergy of different pandemics that are working together um, to affect people disproportionately. Thank you, that's, that's an excellent point. And uh, also throughout this year, while we were all quarantined, uh, people paid more attention to racism in the United States, as well as other parts of the world. And we started to call the epidemic of racism, right? And, and so that's part of that syndemic, those interlapping epidemics. Uh, but since we're talking about terminology here, an epidemic, is when we have more than is expected. So in some regard, the racism that we have in the United States is not more than expected. It's not like it all of a happened, it became an epidemic. So in that regard, it's been endemic in the United States. It's been part of us. It's been part of our history. So just to be mindful, mindful here, it's really not an epidemic, it's endemic because it's been there all along. It's part of us. <laughs> uh, um, it's only been like a couple minutes and I'm already my mind's already getting blown um, thank you so much for for um, defining that for us and kind of you know including all those especially syndemic I think that's really helpful to kind of keep in mind um, I'd like to move us along with um, you know if uh, if you all can 
speak to some of the disparities in health outcomes that communities of color face in the midst of COVID-19, as well as communities that are currently impacted by HIV and AIDS. Um, and uh, uh, Dr. Orellana, if you could uh, kick us off with this question, please. Uh, well, I'm, I'm glad we started with the previous uh, question because uh, when we, we're thinking about disparities, right, it's, it's the, the same disparities that for, I think many of us have been working in the HIV field, right? So for the past four decades, we've been learning more about the social and the structural factors that increase the vulnerability of some groups to HIV, right? So racism, discrimination, stigma, poverty, et cetera, et cetera, several of the social and structural factors. And so having done that work in the HIV field, uh, as soon as COVID came in, in the scene, I think many of us who have been doing that work were like, oh crap, this is gonna really affect these communities because we knew already those social vulnerabilities, right? That, that, that exist in, in, in our system. And so, um, I mean, I, I'll let Jonathan and Allison talk more about it, but just again, just thinking, uh, especially given the title of our presentation today, right, in regards to discrimination and stigma and many other of those social forces, right? So, so again, when thinking about those issues and, and, and disparities, we're thinking about those social forces, those social structure that are outside of us. So it, it has nothing to do with us as minority people or, or, or any kind of people. All these are social forces, social structures that structure our environment and the way we, we live and the way we deal with the world around us every day. And it's those structures, right? That determine how good we do with what comes out of. So we have a lot of privilege and money and all that stuff, then we do we deal better with, with those adversities. And when we don't have those resources, we don't do as well. So when we're talking about those social and structural factors are those forces that structure our lives and our worlds. And I'll, I'll, I'll let the others. I would say that during um, the pandemic, it's been, you know, to Dr. Or Oriana's point, um, a lot of the um, structural issues that we've had in the past have really been highlighted and put into the forefront in the news, um, you know, showing that. And, and so I just want to dive a little bit deeper into what, what you were explaining and how we got here. So, uh, you know, we in the United States in particular have um, created structures that have, um, segregated communities and put uh, Latinx folks and African-American people in neighborhoods that are low income and, and away from all of the resources, right? And, and, and intentionally did that, right? So, you know, a lot, of, a lot of our communities do not have easy access to transportation, to affordable housing or safe housing. We um, are over policed and we are, uh, you know, we often live very far from where we work and we live very far from our, from healthcare, from clinics and hospitals. And in, in, the, in, in the American South, you know, in North Carolina right now, I'm, I live in, in Winston-Salem where we also have a large agricultural um, community and um, members of our community who are undocumented who, and who oftentimes don't speak very strong English, who, have, who are working in factories and who are working in agricultural um, contexts, who, don't, who also don't have, I would say the, um, don't have language support, <laughs> you know, there, there, it's just the South is like, what Spanish, what, what does that mean? <laughs> so there, you know, there's, it's just a, a secondary people, it's an afterthought to think about language support. Um, and so all of those, those things, you know, have been that those existed before the pandemic. And they really, been, and they made people living with HIV very vulnerable to, you know, to HIV because, you know, we, we didn't have access to the resources. And so when the pandemic hit, um, it became even worse because 
not only is it, you know, uh, swapping fluids and those kinds of things that put people at, at risk for, for a disease, but now it's airborne. And so, you know, that then creates this uh, perfect storm where the, the people who are able to stay at home, who can afford to stay at home and don't have to work, don't have to leave their homes to go to work and who are, who, you know, who make salaries can stay at home, can hire help and, and, and have the internet and resources to protect themselves. And even the kind of the public health strategies that were created to protect people were created for those people who could stay at home. And so the rest of us who could not stay at home, who needed to go work in the agriculture, who needed to go work in the factories, who need, who were essential workers, who, you know, we, we were vulnerable. And, and also we didn't have the COVID testing site set up in our communities and we didn't have access to clinics to get any type of care. And then on top of that, when you do go to actually finally access healthcare, there have been a lot of issues around uh, discrimination, you know, uh, among health providers who, you know, assume that you won't survive or, or that you don't really know, you don't really have the symptoms or that you don't, you can't afford the care. And so there's those kind of multiple layers that have created um, disparities uh, and have been um, made even worse during this pandemic. Yeah, and, I, and I'd also like to add that a lot of these social determinants of health have been driving um, the HIV epidemic for a very long time, since the beginning of the epidemic, um, and they, ha they haven't been addressed, right? So we've been talking about how um, housing, the lack of housing is a public health crisis. We've been talking about how, you know, not having health insurance is a public health crisis. And we've been talking about how those social determinants of health and gender inequity are driving the HIV pandemic. Um, but yet when, we, when COVID-19 started, uh, we, we resort to those individual level ways of preventing the disease. We resort to masking, we resort to looking and hoping for a vaccine when we know that the next pandemic is gonna come and we're still gonna have those drivers, those underlying drivers of syndemics that are going to fuel um, the ongoing and emerging pandemic. So unless we really address those issues at the core and, and if, if the government and public health listens uh, to the fact that the lack of housing, to incarceration, to you know, access to safe employment and, ed and education, all those things that we've been talking about, you know, unless we address those, we're gonna be continue to have pandemics that affect um, people of color disproportionately. So in, in, in uh, not wrapping, but putting this together, what we've been talking about re regarding the question of health outcomes, given everything that, that everybody just shared, now we see, just giving the example in Oregon, right? For example, with, with Latinos, right? Since April, meaning we, we learned about COVID in, in, in February, March, right? Since we started to collect data, Latinos have been three, four, five, six times more likely to get COVID than our white counterparts, right? So that, that's been the trend here in Oregon. Similarly, uh, for everybody in the audience, uh, in the journal, The Lancet, there's just a special issue in the last few days on HIV in the United States. It's a really nice series of articles. They have a really nice infograph on, on these disparities also of HIV. So for Latinos, African-Americans, sexual minorities, transgender people. So again, when compared to whites, uh, Latinos, African-Americans are six times, 10 times, and for transgender people of color, a hundred times more than, than, than white cis people. So uh, those disparities, right? And everything we talk about, we've known them from HIV. If we look at them both right now, they're very similar. And so what we all need to think is that we all get vaccinated for COVID next week and COVID goes away, these issues remain. These issues are still there. They've been there for HIV and they're gonna be there for the next epidemic. And they are there for other epidemics, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, trauma, mental health. So all those things are still there. So 
I'm glad as, as uh, Dr. Matthew says that COVID has highlighted that right now, but all of us need to be aware and on, on the same, uh, you know, on, on the same uh, boat here that we really need to deal with this now and in the future because they've been there and they're gonna be there after we all get vaccinated. So. Yeah, that is, very, that is a very good point. You know, it's not gonna go away once we all get vaccinated. Like, um, and speaking of things that have been highlighted, um, uh, uh, I wanna move forward to uh, kind of our next section and discussion here, um, you know, stigma, fear and discrimination. Um, you know, those have definitely been highlighted throughout uh, COVID-19, um, definitely present before, for sure. Um, just extremely evident um, during the pandemic as well. Um, so uh, what role does stigma, fear, and discrimination play when um, we look at the impacts of COVID-19, specifically on communities of color? Um, and additionally, uh, how does that similarly apply to uh, people living with or impacted by HIV and populations who are at risk of getting HIV? Um, I'll pass this along to uh, Dr. Jonathan Garcia. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. I think that gets to a lot of the social factors um, and places where we can intervene um, as individuals, as communities, and as families. Um, and so when you're thinking about what the greatest assets are uh, for Latinx communities and many of the you know, new Americans and, and African American communities in the United States, uh, ethnic and cultural enclaves, you know, places where densely populated groups where we have uh, exchange of cultural you know, centers and, and we have people that talk to, speak the same language, that share the same food, uh, that can really resonate with experiences outside of that cultural enclave. Um, and these include churches, um, community centers, you know, places where you can go to find social support, right? And so what we see in the case of HIV, uh, for instance, is that folks who are more vulnerable to HIV, um, such as LGBTQ plus people, are actually often excluded from elements of these essential support systems, um, such as from churches and families. And so the multiplicative effect of being excluded not only from the broader society, but also from the essential support systems that exist to support us as part of these cultural and ethnic enclaves leaves LGBTQ people further isolated, right? And so when you're thinking about this in terms of HIV, you see that reflected in the, um, you know, the, the unwillingness to, uh, to, to uh, take PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis, to prevent HIV, right? And you see that in terms of perceptions of, of others that are sex negative and, and judgmental rather than thinking about tools that can actually prevent ex, uh, HIV infection. So it affects the actual prevention tools. When you're thinking about it in terms of COVID-19, you have a fewer of those sexuality related stigmas but when you think about, think about an, H an LGBTQ person, a trans person who's already been isolated from their family, who's already living in a rural community, and now pack on top of that, the social isolation that has been generated by COVID-19, right? So you're, you're adding layers of isolation to that. And so that results again in, in really, really harsh health outcomes, especially in terms of self-harm and suicide, which are very grave among the gravest, I would say the gravest health outcomes when people are led to, to commit suicide, right? And so when we're thinking about the disparities in mental health, among LGBTQ, Latinx, and African Americans due to COVID-19 intersecting with HIV, it's, it's among the bravest possible situations. And so, I mean, I, it is. I, I think it's, it's, it's one of those situations when you're thinking about what are our greatest strengths um, and really being able to change that uh, in order to be inclusive of those who are most vulnerable. I want to echo what Dr. Garcia is saying. Um, there's also been a significant increase in domestic violence against women um, during the pandemic, and um, you know the I guess the threat of evictions and those kinds of things 
um, you know, make it even harder for people to uh, find safe harbor. And a lot of the shelters have been closed and, um, you know, and so even those safe, again, like those safe places are now closed. And so, it, you know, I think what, and child abuse, yes, thank you. And so some of the, um, you know, if we wanted to think about the opportunity, there's potential opportunities, I think also, you know, as, as we see these um, disparities <laughs> widen even more, there have been actually some intentional efforts to create funding to support and, and think about new ways to reach people uh, virtually and to address some of these disparities that I think did not exist before COVID-19. Um, and so, for example, the Faith Coordinating Center that I uh, am running right now, you know, this, this did not exist uh, a month ago. <laughs> uh, and so it's, you know, it's an intentional effort to try to work with uh, faith communities uh, and to build their capacity to address stigma uh, around HIV and to really have conversations about sexuality and to be also establish kind of an infrastructure for, for health ministries so that uh, we can, you know, talk about trauma and informed care and mental health. And, and you know, of course, those things don't exist yet, but, uh, you know, hopefully also being able to create some coordinated efforts around those things, I think will, you know, that's, that's the direction that I would like to see all of us go. And when we're thinking about, you know, what, what can we bring out of COVID-19, <laughs> right, is, you know, recognizing the need for us to coordinate efforts and to communicate with each other and not just operate in silos. I think that has been uh, also a contributor to, you know, there's a lot of organizations that address those issues that Dr. Garcia mentioned, but they, we oftentimes don't communicate with each other. And so that also kind of creates inefficiency in, in being able to actually serve and address those, those challenges. Dr. Oriana, is there anything you would like to add to um, uh, um, Dr. Garcia or Matthew's response? No, they, 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 they were so fantastic in the, in, in the, in the response to, to the question. Uh, um, yeah, again, just uh, again, just the the parts of, of the question about this, the stigma and discrimination, right? That they, they both talk about is that just again a reminder to 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 all the audience here that uh, that stigma is it's, it's a, a a social process, right? Where 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 the society, the mainstream, those in power, right, impose uh, a certain. Uh, aspect of a, the characteristic of a group of people who is undesirable to that community in power. That's all it is. That's, I mean, it's a big deal, the, the stigma thing, but it, and, and, and it's a precursor to discrimination, right? Once, once a characteristic has been ascribed as undesirable, then you can discriminate against that. And so that's 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 the, the 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 connection there between the stigma and discrimination. So when we've been talking about segregation and where people live and the type of housing that people have, is based on that, right? It's uh, in, in who ends up living in 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 housing that in poor housing, right? Or or in places where there's eight, ten people living in one apartment, and therefore you can isolate during COVID and all that stuff, right? So it's a certain group of people, right? Many many of many of our families. And, and it's, it's that part that the, the, the larger forces, right, discriminate against these groups that end up now uh, getting more COVID, right, in the, except, in the example of COVID. But, but it's that, that combination of the stigma and, and discrimination. Right? And um, so, and then everything else that, <laughs> that Dr. Garcia and Matthew said, but I just wanted to put that there, just that connection for your question in regards to stigma and discrimination and how they go hand in hand. That, that those are great. the case for HIV and all the other things that all the other 
uh, issues that we've been talking about. Yeah, and, and I wanted to add, because you both made me think about this, um, that the effects of stigma and discrimination can actually lead to a great deal of mistrust in government and medical institutions that directly challenge the uptake of even the individual level interventions like vaccines, right? And so um, in, a, in a research project that I'm engaging in right now um, in LACE, which is engaging the next Latinx allies for change and equity, uh, we did some interviews with parents and, and children of Latino families, um, and we found that some Latino families had carried historical mistrust of medical institutions because they experienced population control in Latin America. Um, and they thought they, some of their distrust and, and the myths that they carried forward about the vaccine had to do with fear of sterilization which was surprising, but not surprising if you think about it in terms of historical trauma. And you see historical trauma uh, discussed in many of our people of color's histories, right? With Native Americans and others who have, and, and you know, the history of violence and slavery against black people. And so you're thinking about historical trauma really challenging how medical interventions are trusted and uptaken. So it's not just about you know what's happening today, it's really what's ingrained under our skin and what we've learned, right? That we, we've learned um, to talk to children about, you know, to give children the talk so that when they encounter the police, they don't get murdered. And so that's very serious and it's part of historical trauma. Um, and so that's also affecting, and, and so those things seem very distant from something like taking a vaccine because a vaccine is you know, very cut and dry, objective public health standard, I trust science, right? But that's not a given for most of our peoples. Yes, uh, I really appreciate you mentioning that um, because I do, I do wanna mention that I am a DACA recipient and my experience as, as an immigrant here has definitely, I, I definitely, my family and I definitely carry some of that um, historical trauma of just having a hard time trusting these institutions that, you know, since I've been little have been, I've been told have been out to get us, um, you know, for being illegal, for not belonging here. Um, so I really do appreciate you kind of highlighting that a little bit. Um, uh, I guess, um, I think what I would like to move us along with is kind of, um, you know, we're identifying these invisible barriers. We're identifying these obstacles and these challenges that communities of color face. Um, but what can we really do on a day-to-day -day basis? You know, a daily action that we individually can do to confront these, to, to to challenge those challenges and kind of overcome them. Um, you know, I guess like, and, and anyone's really um, willing to, any, any of our panelists are welcome to, I invite any of you to, to answer this question, but um, you know, it's, it's one thing to identify the, the issue and it's another for, you know, how do I as an individual make that effort to create change within those realms? I think it can be overwhelming to think about changing whole systems or an entire federal government system. Uh, but, you know, I think one good example of change has been the elections, right? Showing that one vote counts. And, you know, and so even if you can't vote, there are a lot of people in this country who cannot vote. But even if you can't vote, you know, having, um, voicing, voicing your concerns, voicing your, uh, you know, your opinion is something that is, uh, you know, a protected right for everyone in this country. So that's one thing I would say that everybody can do is, is speak up <laughs> um, and, and, you know, and, and highlight these issues. We wouldn't know the, about these issues unless you told us, right? And so that's one thing. And then uh, I think on the, on the, all of these, I, there are people within these institutions who can be trusted. And I think being able to identify who those, who those people are and who those organizations are, who have the best interests at heart and who are doing the work, who are out in the community, who are, are visible and, um, 
consistent and you know working with those organizations and and individuals i think um are some ways that we can make change and and address um you know barriers to barriers to transportation barriers to housing etc so for example um at Wake Forest Baptist Health, you know, that's one of the institutions that participated in this uh, population control, as you called it, or eugenics movement. But they have been, you know, since then they they have uh, really tried to create a concerted and intentional effort to repair some of that um, trauma and, and to put in, um, you know, uh, programs and institutions that that are directly addressing that and so uh, going out into the community talking to people hearing hearing their concerns hearing their challenges and working collaboratively with other um, institutions in the city I think thinking about it on a local level um, is something that everybody can t can work on rather than trying to think about changing an entire <laughs> um, institution and um, and I think also, you know, there are so there is an organization here in in uh, Forsyth County called the Hispanic League that actually creates um, documents that uh, people can use to, you know, because a lot of times uh, with undocumented uh, immigrants, we don't have any form of identification. And so they they have gone through the process of creating a uh, form of identification that can be used to access healthcare and access um, other resources uh, without it um, being, you know, a detriment to to the public charge or thinking about, you know, any other kind of um, uh, penalization uh, for having for for having documentation. So I think those are some creative ways that we've been trying to think about how to increase access to resources without also putting people at risk. And so I would add that um, a lot of the folks that I've seen in the in the chat, for instance, who are case managers, who are community health workers, um, who are working closely with our communities, who are part of our communities, who are lay health workers uh, that have experiences uh, from both our communities and knowledge of health are among the most important in addressing these issues. And I think they should be properly compensated. That's an easy way to, to start to fix the problem and to establish trust with our communities. They should be properly compensated um, and offered professional development. So th because they're the link between the systems that our communities don't trust and our communities, right? And so it's really tapping into the community assets, building um, awareness and an alliance between folks who experience different types of marginalization. So folks who may be Latinx, but not LGBTQ and LGBTQ folks and trying to find commonalities across those experiences of marginalization to know that it's not you know, one marginalized group against the other, as sometimes we're pitted, right? We're, 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 we're thought to think we have to compete for these limited and scarce resources. Instead, we think about the system of oppression that forces us to pass as what we're not, right? Be white passing or whatever that is in terms of trying to feel like we're not our, our authentic self. So really trying to identify with others with our marginalized experience and using that as one of our greatest tools. I think that's something we can try to do on a regular basis too. Yeah, I, I, thanks for saying that. And uh, I, was, I was thinking a couple of things here. One thing I wanted to say first is that uh, some of these barriers uh, are not that invisible. So we, we call them some invisible, but many, when, when we go to a clinic that serves the Latino community and everything is in English, that's very visible where the discrimination is. So, so a lot of these things are, 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 are visible. And one thing to think about is, um, again, we're talking about discrimination and stigma, right? And some characteristic of the other group that other group doesn't like and if that other group has power, then they can discriminate against. And I, I, I want all of us to think about uh, in intersectional terms, 
and the role we play in stigmatizing and discriminating others too, right? Within the Latino community or other communities of color, right? And there's a lot of stigma and homophobia, right? Against sexual minorities within some of our communities, right? So that's discrimination and that's stigma, and, right? And so what can we all do, right? To, to, to change some of this, which is, comes to your question, what can we do as individuals, right? And the, the thing is, uh, and as, as Dr. Matthews was saying, we, we can change the larger system. Sometimes, sometimes we can, right? But uh, uh, I'm not going to set out myself to change those people out there who are racist against me, right? That's their problem, right? If they're like that, right? I'm gonna work on me and myself and those around me and look at also at the places where I have harmed others, right? So that's the intersectionality. How, so I can expect others to change, right? If, if I don't work on myself and my own biases against other people. So I'll start with that, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and making sure that I'm not harming others and that I'm learning about others, right? And so that's part of the, of, uh, the, the, the process of working in, this, in the stigma reduction, right? Or the stigma elimination is it's, it's interacting. If I have some issues with a, with a certain group, uh, uh, learn about them, get to know people, right? I mean, I, I, I've been socially constructed, so I have these issues against this group. And, 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 and nobody is going to, to give me a pill again. I have to do something myself in order to change that perception I have of that group, right? And so that's what other people need to do too, but I'm not going to give them that prescription. It's up to them, right? And so right now, in, during the pandemic, we have seen a lot of that, right? We, we've seen a lot of mutual aid. And that's what I would say also that we can do at the individual level, right? Right now, during the pandemic, we saw people uh, making masks and delivering masks, right? And, and bringing food to people. And so again, if a part of discrimination in the system is not providing translation services in Spanish, for example, if, you, if you're bilingual, go help if you can, right? I mean, or if you're vaccinated, go help. That's something that we can do to do something against that system that is discriminating a group of people, right? So let's use the skills we have. Let's use what we can to, to help each other right now during this moment of crisis. And then uh, continue to work that after the crisis because there's other crises out there, right? But uh, um, again, at the individual level, it's up to each one of us to work on our own biases against others. And if I work a little bit on that and Jonathan and Jose and others, that's a stigma and discrimination reduction. And uh, so the more of us do that, uh, that that's, that's a start. This is at the individual level. At the policy level, there's many other things that many of us are doing, including the, the election, all the way to the election. And then uh, some of the, the work that we've been doing uh, within our county health departments and things like that in order to inform vaccine distribution or in, increasing testing sites in, in, in places where where minority people live, et cetera, et cetera. So there's stuff that we can do at the policy level and then stuff that we can do within ourselves and those around us. I, would, I wanna add to that, um, you know, during the, with the, uh, we, I noticed that there were not a lot of community voices at the table um, with hospitals, right? So I work, I work, I used to work at a hospital and I noticed there was not a lot of community voices at the table, Hispanic or African-American. And so I created a council, uh, you know, pulled together maybe uh, 15 uh, organizations uh, who, who served those communities. And we just started meeting and, and talk and giving feedback. Um, you know, obviously I worked in the hospital, so I had the, I guess that I was the inside person, but, you know, finding someone who can be your advocate within those institutions, those larger institutions, and then pull, we pulled together a group of advisory board members who then gave feedback on how to address COVID-19 in the community. So that was 15 people who had this huge impact across the city and, and across the county. And then the, and then the hospital started paying attention and they started implementing a lot of the recommendations from the community into their larger strategy. And then also the hospital started working with their rival hospital to address the, the, the um, pandemic, you know, regardless of 
who you're going to. Are you going to Wake Forest? Are you going to another hospital? We want to be able to have a coordinated effort because we had representatives from the community who were saying it doesn't matter what the hospital is. We just need to have resources, right? Um, and and then the state started paying attention. So I think that that's to my point, you know, earlier about saying you know starting small or starting within your own kind of local context can actually grow to have a bigger a bigger um, influence. So <clears throat> I think one of the things that we, I've learned the most from the HIV and AIDS pandemic is the, the value of community mobilization. And I think this really resonates with, with what both Allison and Roberto are saying, thinking about the HIV and AIDS social movements throughout the world that have fought for access to essential medications that have fought for access to prevention and really established health social movements for other health outcomes, right? For immobilized people with uh, breast cancer and uh, environmental health movements that have borrowed from imagery in the HIV and AIDS movement, the ribbons, the quilts, you know, bringing people together in solidarity. And so really trying to think about ourselves as part of a whole and to connect with each other um, and to set aside differences and mobilize as communities has been an effective strategy to affect systems change. And so this is something like we're learning about the origins of HIV pandemics and what has fueled them. We can also learn about what has tried to solve them, what has, ac ha has given access to medications to many around the world who didn't have access, right? And so um, I think those are some good learning opportunities for us as well. And, and I do unfortunately wanna move us forward to um, the Q&A section of this uh, event, um, but uh, I really appreciate you all for kind of, um, for everything that you just shared that's just so impactful and eye-opening and just all these perspectives are so helpful in figuring out how to approach these challenges. Um, uh, but moving on to the uh, Q&A section and before this sun continues to blind my view. Um, uh, one question we have here is, uh, uh, I am curious about how faith is addressing issues of health. And um, anyone is welcome to answer that. Can you repeat the question? I'm sorry, I was reading the chat. <laughs> oh, you're good, you're good. Um, the question was, I am curious about how faith is addressing issues of health. Um, so I would, you know, I'll just start just because I'm with the Faith Coordinating Center. Uh, I would say that uh, there are churches who and and pastors, faith faith leaders who have a platform, and you know, they've always had a platform, but you know, especially now during COVID, they are the trusted leaders, right, in our communities. We, we value what they say. And so the um, faith leaders have an opportunity and I would, I would argue an obligation to communicate um, accurate health information and communicate um, you know, a message of love and healing in this time, especially for our LGBTQ uh, community members and for people living with HIV. Um, as, as, as well as the larger community. I would also say that, you know, there are um, health ministries that have been established, uh, you know, and like food pantries and that kind of thing. And so there are churches who have started mobilizing in this time um, to address around COVID. And so when we're thinking about HIV, however, I think that because there's stigma and tied to HIV that is not necessarily as tied to COVID, I think it has been um, more difficult because people are, are concerned about talking about sex and sexuality. And so, you know, for me, I, I would like to see us also have open conversations about how can we practice our faith and integrate sexuality because God gave us sexuality just like God gave us every every other aspect of our humanity. And um, and so, you know, I think pushing forward that conversation, but also recognizing the power of com the congregation and the, 
and the faith communities who oftentimes are a little bit probably more progressive than the pastor um, because you know one one doesn't exist with the without the other and so I go back to that original point that we as individuals you know when we put our voices together actually have a lot of power and a lot of uh, influence in in being able to say hey as congregations we want to have these conversations we want to talk about sex we want to talk about sexuality we want to talk about uh, faith and healing and relationships and and you know we want to talk about HIV and so I think there there is um, uh, a potential there and, and yeah so I'm gonna stop <laughs> I just want to briefly sure. comment also on the other side of being uh, being careful with the faith community because the faith community means a lot of things to a lot of people and yeah. faith means a lot of things to a lot of people right and so as we learned today, the, the, the Catholic Church in New Orleans said not to take the Johnson & Johnson vaccine because it has uh, fetal uh, cells. And so that's, that's the faith community, right? That's the Catholic Church telling people, don't take this vaccine. So, um, so there's just many, many yeah, faces yeah. to everything we're talking about, about faith, government, this, that, uh, there. So just we all have to be, uh, 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 you know, mindful and careful about. I, I agree. And then, so one of the things that we tried to do in Enlace is to tap into core values that the community has. So um, whereas, you know, we, we might think that communities are monolithic, that the, they hold the same beliefs. There's a lot of diversity in faith communities. And one of the things that we found that was a core value is this idea of loving thy neighbor. I saw it in the chat and it's really thinking about, um, you know, the value of someone who is suffering and, and helping someone who is suffering. And so tapping into that core value of a lot of faith communities and thinking about how, you know, and exposing stories about how people are suffering and then that suffering is leading to grave consequences like suicide is an effective strategy for mobilizing and moving the needle um, in, in faith communities. So I think the more we can tap into core values, um, I think the more we can generate some collaboration among the faith communities, even across faith communities too. Uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, we only managed to answer one question in the Q&A, um, but um, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, it's checking the time, 157. I think we're, I'm going to unfortunately have to move on, um, but uh, I just want to say thank you to Dr. Garcia, Dr. Orellana, and Dr. Matthews for attending today. You all had so much to share and such amazing perspectives to kind of give all of our attendees. Um, and I saw you all sort of engaging with the chat as well. So I really appreciate that as well. Um, I'm gonna share my screen real quick, just to kind of give some closing, closing thoughts here. All right. So uh, we do have our conference coming up uh, June 24th and 25th. Some of these topics that we covered today will be present at the conference. So I hope you all are able to join us. Um, and uh, our next uh, event will actually be on April 10th, which is National Youth HIV AIDS Awareness Day. Um, the idea is to spread awareness through creative expression. So we're gonna be uh, uh, incorporating the art of youth between 13 to 24 into this virtual exhibit. And, you know, there's just gonna be interpreting what um, uh, Me Cuido Te Cuido, our uh, sexual health uh, program here at uh, Familia San Acción, what does that mean to them? Me Cuido Te Cuido meaning, you know, I'm um, taking care of myself, I'm taking care of, of my, my partners, my community, the health of my partner, the health of my community, um, you know, what that means to them, what National Youth HIV AIDS Awareness Day means to them. Um, and uh, that will be going live on April 10th. Um, uh, we're also gonna be having a couple events in May and June as listed here, breaking down barriers um, and a Pride Month, Pride Month kickoff event. Um, I do wanna encourage folks to 